welcome to BGR's third breakfast briefing of 2015. I am thrilled to be here today. This is my first breakfast briefing as president and CEO of BGR. My name is Celeste Coco Ewing, and I'd like to take a moment to welcome our BGR members and um, the elected officials who are here with us. We have Louisiana State Representative Walt Leger, and we also have Covington City Council member Jerry Connor. A BGR's mission is to improve public policy making and to promote efficient use of public resources. And we do this in many ways, but one of the ways we do this is by publishing in-depth, data-driven, and I'm proud to say award-winning research reports. We also monitor 41 governmental agencies in Orleans, in Jefferson, and in St. Tammany Parish. Another way we do this is providing these breakfast briefings. This is a way to allow citizens and public policy decision makers to come together to discuss important issues. Now you'll notice that on your tables you have pieces of paper. These are to allow you to write questions. We will have a question and answer period at the end and all questions must be written. Please feel free to write your name if you'd like to be acknowledged. Now BGR has one annual fundraising event it's our annual luncheon. This year it's going to be December 10th at the Marriott and I am uh, delighted to announce that New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd will be with us as a keynote speaker. So we hope you all can join us for that. Finally, I wanted to express our gratitude to Iberia Bank and I know we have Hunter Hill who is New Orleans market president for Iberia here with us today. So thank you so much because the sponsorship by Iberia allows us to make these breakfast briefings free and open to the citizens. So thank you so much. And now to introduce our topic this morning, we have Dennis Waltering. You all know Dennis is a former anchor of WWL-TV. He continues to serve the community as a board member of BGR. Dennis. Thank you, Celeste, and welcome. We also want to uh, mention that uh, Plaquemines Parish President Amos Cormier is here as well. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> Louisiana's coastal wetlands provide countless benefits, as we all know. On the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, we are acutely aware of the wetlands' role in protecting our area from storm surges. When we eat in local restaurants, we enjoy the bounty from one of the world's top fisheries. And the wetlands are an integral part of the recreational and cultural life of Louisiana. Today, as we all know, Louisiana's fragile wetlands are in the midst of an escalating catastrophe. As Executive Director of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, Kyle Graham oversees projects to prevent and mitigate the loss of Louisiana's wetlands. His agency also ensures that these projects are consistent with the state's comprehensive master plan for a sustainable coast. Prior to his career with the state of Louisiana, Graham worked as a wetland scientist. He holds bachelor's and master's, degree, master's degrees in biology. Today, Mr. Graham will provide an overview of coastal restoration issues and discuss specific projects funded from the BP settlement. Mr. Graham, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me, and thanks for coming out early this morning. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see some familiar faces and to see a lot of new folks um, who are interested in the coastal issues and the work that we've been doing. As mentioned, I, I want to give a kind of a high-level overview, and then we're going to dive into some um, looking forward. Lots of folks are very interested in the BP dollars, the types of dollars that are flowing, the timing of the dollars, and kind of what we're thinking as far as expenditures um, and what, what um, could happen if those dollars are applied. Um, to our coastal restoration program. We see the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority and the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority Board, uh, we're, we, we're a result of Katrina. Um, as a result of Hurricane Katrina, um, as you're well aware, everybody that um, could write and had a pen wrote about everything that we were doing wrong in Louisiana um, and thinking about how to do things better. And one of the themes throughout those documents on the coastal issues 
were that we needed to get our act together. We needed to think about how to align all of the actions we do in the coast, whether it's where we build coastal restoration projects or where we put roads, where we're in, um, funding for infrastructure for communities. And so as a result, the um, legislature and the um, administration created the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority Board. Um, this board is the foundation of everything that we do here in Louisiana. And in fact, um, post Hurricane Katrina, or Hurricane Sandy, um, a lot of folks from New York came down to evaluate what it is that we were doing in Louisiana. And this is what they pointed to as probably the strength, the greatest strength of our program. The CPRA board is the place um, where the decisions are made and sets the policy as well as the plan on how to align all of our actions for the state of Louisiana. And on that board, you have the secretaries from the Department of Transportation, um, you've got DNR, DEQ, um, various other agencies that are involved in the coastal area, as well as local representatives. Um, that board is does a couple things. One, they approve all of the expenditures and or the projects to be sure that they're consistent with an overall approach. And then they update that approach through updating the coastal master plan at least every five years. Um, the first master plan came out in 2007. It's a very broad, if any of you have been involved in large planning efforts, um, as you would expect, it was a very broad planning effort. Um, it largely had a, a great suite of objectives, but it was hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to implement. Um, we modified the Coastal Master Plan in 2012, and we started to, to uh, refine it. We started to put sideboards on a little bit and try to come up with something that was a little bit more realistic. And so the master plan that we're operating under right now is the 2012 Master Plan. Uh, it's often thought of as a $50 billion plan over 50 years. Um, we're currently neck deep in updating the next master plan, um, which will be coming out um, for approval in the 2017 timeframe. So this time next year, every presentation we will be giving is over what the new master plan is looking like and kind of the projects that are being there. Um, updating that master plan is really important because it allows us to bring in um, new ideas on revenue streams, allow us to involve new science, allows us to take in, in the fact the different things that we're learning as the coastal communities grow, as our projects mature. The master plan is implemented by lots of agencies. The group that I'm actually over is in the bottom right corner. It's the CPRA Implementation Agency. We do most of the work in the master plan, but not all of it. Um, we're made up of about 168 scientists and engineers. We are fortunate that we have a budget about seven to eight hundred million dollars per year over the last six years. So we've seen significant amount of investment that have been coming through our agency. Most of the work that we do, um, and we'll see it later, is, is largely on building and helping support the development and the construction of levees, as well as working toward um, restoration projects and getting those restoration projects um, on the ground. When the CPRA board was initially set up, it was to handle this. So the, they, wrote the, they wrote all of this stuff. They said, hey, you need to get everything aligned. But the federal government appropriated a tremendous amount of money for the hurricane protection system. And it was actually right around $14.6 billion in total when you add up not only the hurricane protection system around New Orleans, but also work down in Plaquemines Parish on the New Orleans, the Venice project, and some of the drainage projects around New Orleans as well. What they did in Congress is they, they required there to be one non-Fed sponsor. Um, they didn't want to work with all of the di different levy agencies. They wanted to work with just one entity in the state of Louisiana. And so a lot of the, the thinking behind the push of not only having one aligned thought and one aligned plan was also to have one place where they could engage with the federal government to be that non-Fed sponsor for the dollars that were coming in as, her as a result of um, Hurricane Katrina and a lot of the supplemental appropriations that were coming. When we started to look at it and we started to think about everything that was part of the master plan, we realized that in addition to dealing with um, protecting the citizens and thinking about reducing the, the estimated annual damages from flooding, we also needed to think about the land loss and, and address how we can truly have a sustainable coast for Louisiana. Is it possible to not only deal with what we've experienced in the past, but looking forward, is it possible to create and how large of a footprint could we sustain in coastal Louisiana with the resources that are available? So this is a map of, of the wetlands that have been lost, and this just goes into 2010. This is a product that USGS puts out. We're actually anticipating a new 
map any day now. Um, I haven't heard quite the date. I know that they've been working on it. We should see something new very soon. Um, but going just between 1932 and 2010, we've lost approximately 1,900 square miles of land. And it's wetlands, but it's still something that we qualify as land for Louisiana, a very valuable and vital resource. Um, there's been a lot of effects from that, um, not only, um, but probably the most significant one is the increase of the effect of storm surge from storms on our communities, which just increases the cost of um, potential flooding and the estimated annual damages experienced by our communities as a result of not only hurricanes right now, but even a heavy wind. Um, we're starting to see flooding in many of our outlying coastal communities. Um, so one of the very first things we did is we wanted to wrap our arms around, well, how big is this coastal land loss problem? If we look out um, 100 years or 25 years or 50 years, one, how far can we look out and have some sort of comfort that it's somewhat reliable? And then two, how great is that problem? And so what we settled on is we looked out 50 years. And when we look out 50 years and we start to think about the additional land loss that our state could experience, um, we're looking at losing at approximately an additional 1,750 square miles of land. Um, and that's currently the, the, a lot of the scene that is going on in our coastal right now. If you're familiar with the coast, if you're an active fisherman, if you fly over the coast, um, you'll notice uh, in many of those areas that you're, perhaps you went when you were a child or even a decade ago, um, a lot of the land has been changing and shifting and we're losing a tremendous amount of our wetlands um, currently across our coast. Um, and this is having tremendous potential effects on our communities. This is if we do nothing. Um, so this is what we would call the future without action <coughs> period. So future without action. Um, but we don't anticipate on doing nothing. Um, we obviously anticipate doing a suite of projects against our coast. And so the question becomes, what do you do? The 2012 master plan has a suite of projects to address not only um, the land loss, but I, I, ideally also the re reducing those estimated annual damages to flooding to our communities. And so that $50 billion over 50 year plan that is currently, that we're currently operating under, um, truly has a suite of projects that both gear toward um, protecting from flooding as well as coastal restoration. And in fact, it's about $26 billion on the flood protection side and about $24 billion on the ecosystem restoration side. One of the things you'll notice about the master plan if you pick it up and start diving into it, it's not just one project that we do over and over and over again. If you're familiar with coastal restoration techniques or if you're familiar with hurricane protection um, techniques, uh, there's lots of different ways to go about it, whether it's putting rocks along the shoreline or it's doing marsh creation or it's rebuilding barrier islands. What we found when we start to evaluate these things is that all of those techniques work in the right place. And so we truly look at a whole suite of projects and techniques across the coast. We in integrate both um, restoring and building oyster reefs as well as putting in shoreline protection measures in certain areas doing marsh creation in certain areas, rebuilding specific barrier islands in places where we think that they can reduce storm surge. And then for the coastal, um, for the communities, we recognize we can't protect everybody. It'd be nice to go out there and say, hey, everybody's gonna have 100 year protection. And in fact, that's what's in the 2012 master plan. But there's not enough dollars to do that. It would be disingenuous to say that that is a possible or it's practical way to, to go about it. So what we've attempted to do is put forth um, a suite of protection projects um, in areas that we do think is doable for the future. And many of those systems are in place, some of the systems are new, um, but we're looking at the value of a lot of the industry areas, looking at the, the commerce that comes through those areas, looking at the existing communities to try to um, protect um, as much of the economic drivers of Louisiana as possible. Um, recognizing that it's just, we can't put back everything that's been lost and we can't protect everything that we currently have. But somewhere in the middle is a suite of projects that sustains as large of a footprint that we think is practical for coastal Louisiana. The nice thing about coastal Louisiana is we have the Mississippi River. And you look at um, New York City, you look at Miami, they don't have a river that's delivering sediment to them every year or every day. Um, they simply can only build greater protection systems to live behind. 
we have the Mississippi River that does have sediment in it. It's not as much sediment as it has been there historically, but our master plan, a lot of the, the key focus is better utilization of the resources that are passing by us every day. The very resources that built the land that we're standing on today. So how do we better tie the river back into some of these um, areas so that we can utilize those resources so that we don't have to rely on mechanically building, rebuilding everything. On the restoration side of things, our master plan includes about $20 billion worth of dredging. That's a tremendous amount of dredging. And if you put it in perspective on the national scene, our entire domestic dredging budget for the United States is about $1.3 billion a year. Just to keep up with our land loss, we predict it would cost about $2 billion per year in dredging um, just to match the amount of land if that's all we did was, was rebuild via dredging. That math doesn't add up. We would have to have a larger fleet of domestic dredges operating in Louisiana than exist in the entire United States. And we would have to take not only the $500 million that we project in coastal restoration, but make that $2 billion per year just to match our, lo our loss from our wetlands. We currently, when we build our wetland and our, do our wetland projects, we anticipate that every 20 years, we'll lose about 30% of that project. So we're starting to look at ways that we can be a little smarter by re-engaging some of those riverine processes through diversions and hydrologic modifications so that we're simply not putting the wetlands back on the same platform that is, has all of these underlying causes, causes of loss, but starting to actually address those causes, retying it with the river, modifying the way that the salt water is intruding in some of these basins. And some of those projects um, are on the future and some of the projects that we're working on. So what have we been doing? And this is a very busy slide, and I apologize for that, but we often get asked, well, what have you done? Oh, and it went away. We often get asked, well, what have you done? You've got this major problem. You've got this ginormous plan. You want $50 billion over 50 years, but is actually anything occurring in the coast? Um, and the fact is, today, on the ecological restoration side, um, as we stand here today, we have over $491 million of projects under construction. Um, that is 16 different projects. To put that in perspective, the next largest ecological restoration program in the nation is the Everglades, which is about 110 to $150 million um, per year. There's not a larger effort that is actually under construction today anywhere in the United States and arguably in the entire world. And so what hurts us is that you can't necessarily just get in your car and drive down there and see it. But if you did, um, and you went down to, say, um, Port Fouchon, and you stopped at the Kaminata Headland, you would notice that we've been out there placing sediment for a little more than two years on the Kaminata Headland. Um, that project in total is about $221 million. If you drove down toward, uh, down Plaquemines, um, you would see the Long Distance Sediment Pipeline, which is about a $103 million project, and the Grand Liard project that we just finished. You'll see them setting up for the Shell West project, which is about a $78 million project. If you're back over in the Port Fouchon area, you'll see them setting up for the Whiskey Island project. So there's a tremendous amount of work that's going on. It's just somewhat sometimes difficult to see. Um, it's, we're often told that there's a reason why the, the, the agency is named the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, um, and the P comes first. And we're told that's because protection is where the people want to see the dollars spent. And you see that um, relevant in our expenditures. Since Hurricane Katrina, since under the master plan, we have implemented or have under construction a little more than $2 billion of um, restoration projects, and we've implemented or have under construction a little more than $11.2 billion in protection projects. So there's been a tremendous amount that is done. I personally think that the reason that the P is before the R is because they didn't want to have an agency named CRAP, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> It just doesn't quite roll off the tongue. A lot of the work that we've done on the protection side has been on the hurricane protection um, system around New Orleans, but it's important to note that that's not all of the work that we've done. Um, a lot of the work that we've also done is on the La Rose to Golden Meadow site, or lots of little floodgates <coughs> scattered throughout coastal Louisiana, areas where we're having the saltwater intrusion, and we have communities that are flooding and need not maybe a $14.6 billion um, 
system but might need $10 million, which has significant benefits to that community in reducing those estimated annual damages. And we anticipate as we move forward, we'll see more and more and more of those types of investments. The other thing that's important to know is that on the protection side, we largely um, work with the locals and want the locals, the, the levy districts that are responsible for these, a lot of these areas, we want to have them build those projects. Um, those are projects that they're ultimately doing the operations and maintenance of. Um, and so we want to support them. We often put up the dollars, for example, around the hurricane protection system. The state of Louisiana is on the hook for the hurricane protection system payback, which is about estimated to be about $100 million a year once they um, start, they turn it over to the state of Louisiana. That's pretty common in a lot of these areas. We might put the dollars forward to pay for either the uh, match with the federal government or pay for the individual structure, but we're asking the local entity to do the construction of that work. And we think that's important, one, because we don't have all the resources in-house and don't want to be a giant um, agency that has those types of ebb and flows and personnel, and two, because the locals are the ones who ultimately end up doing the operations of those structures and the maintenance of those structures, and having them at the table early on and intimate with the engineering and design and the building of those projects, we think is gonna make it a lot easier in transitioning those projects in the future. Um, so there's been a lot of work going on. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of work um, left to be done for the coast. Here's a little bit of a snapshot of some of the work that has occurred. Um, on the restoration side, by far our largest investment has been in our barrier islands. And if you ever have the chance to get in a seaplane um, and fly over the coast, um, do it soon so you can see all the work that we built before it erodes away. Um, but if you fly over the Barataria Basin, you'll notice that a lot of those barrier islands have been rebuilt. Um, and so whether it's Pelican Island, Schofield Island, Shell East, Shell West is under construction right now. Um, the, the work that we've done on East Grand Terre and West Grand Terre, um, Grand Isle, the Kamenata Headland, most of the entire Barataria Basin um, barrier islands have been constructed. And in fact, um, we've got one more little piece called Chenier on Kiel um, that NOAA is building as with some of the oil spill dollars. Once that's completed, we largely will have completed the entire barrier island chain. For Barataria Basin, we think that's extremely important. Um, one, at protecting, it's, it, there's not a whole lot of distance in between those barrier islands and the marsh, and they, they do a whole lot of protection for that marsh area. And then two, um, we're, we're ideally going to be implementing some diversions into the basin, into the Barataria Basin side, which we think, again, will help protect those, um, that investment over time. And so um, that basin has been a high priority of ours. If you look at, go back to the big red map, um, the two basins in which we lose, have lost the majority of land in Louisiana are Terrebonne and Barataria Basin, then followed by the Breton Basin. So we've had a lot of emphasis on the Barataria Basin. We're starting to do a tremendous amount more on Terrebonne. The struggle with Terrebonne is there's not a river necessarily to tie it to. Um, so if you're with the Mississippi River, it's a lot easier to potentially tap those resources for Barataria um, and Breton side, but not necessarily for the Terrebonne side. We are working on um, increasing some of the flow off of the Atchafalaya into northern Terrebonne to help with some of those benefits in the, in the future as we move forward. So looking at some of the marsh projects that we've built, and the green, pro the green are the projects that have been constructed and or are under construction. The yellow are ones that um, are currently in planning or engineering and design. And on the marsh creation projects, um, We've had quite a bit of investment recently, especially. Um, most of our focus has been on utilization of Mississippi River sediments. Uh, there, for a long time, when we were doing marsh projects, we would just pick up the near sediment and rebuild the marsh. We're not necessarily reintroducing new sediments into those basins. And while that marsh is beneficial, one of the underlying causes of a lot of our loss is we need new sediment into these basins. And so we've been focused on um, renewable sources of sediments. And about five years ago, we finished the Bayou DuPont first phase, which is the first time that we dredged sediment from the Mississippi River, specifically for the purposes of a strategic marsh creation project. Not just a beneficial use project, but something that we wanted as part of our global master plan. Um, we have since done it again with the Lake Hermitage project, um, and then we did it again for the Shell East project. 
We're now wrapping up the long distance sediment pipeline in Bayou DuPont phase two project and um, we'll be using Shell West. So you've seen a lot of emphasis on getting sediment out of the Mississippi River and into our basins for the, the reconstruction of our wetlands. And we anticipate that we'll see a lot more of that in the future where it's practical. Um, we initially thought we were gonna build this long distance sediment. It was one of the first projects that I got here. Um, it was literally on a napkin and um, now Congressman Graves um, had this kept pushing this, we need to use uh, Mississippi River sediments. And we would go sit down with the engineers and they'd say, but that's not how we do work. And he's like, yeah, but that's where the sediment is that we need to do and we need to push it far. And so we came up with this idea to, to push it at least seven miles. And at that time, that was one of the largest distances that any sediment would have been pushed um, with the hydraulic dredging in the domestic market. Well, in the meantime, we had the oil spill, dollars became available to build Shell East and we were able to take sediment out of the river and pump it 22 miles out to Shell East um, for that project. And so we're doing the engineering de design on this massive long distance sediment pipeline. In the meantime, we tripled it, um, literally um, in an 18 month time frame. So the, the long distance sediment pipeline is out there pushing, but what we're learning is that we're, we, if we think about it and we start to really push the tools that we use in, in Louisiana, um, there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, most of the work that we're attempting to do hasn't been done elsewhere. And so we're pushing not only the engineers that work in the field, but also pushing the contractors that work in the field to do things for the first time. And we're seeing that we can get a whole lot of benefits and do a lot more than many folks that were practical. If you go out to the long distance sediment pipeline, for the first time ever, the dredging company is using electric uh, pumps. They've always used diesel pumps in the, in the past. They've never had a pipeline and wanted to put in an infrastructure um, like what we want to do over time to go in and out and in and out of an area every two to three years to rebuild an area. Um, we're seeing tremendous efficiencies by utilizing those um, electric pumps. And the investment in those infrastructures we'll see not only in this project, but in future projects as we go throughout that area for the next many decades. It's truly changing the program from a one-off, let's go build this project, to think, thinking strategically about where we're gonna go in and out and investing in that infrastructure as we move along. And you'll see more of that as we move into the oil spill dollars. One of the disappointing things as we start to look at all the work we're doing is when you start to look at it against the land loss that um, has occurred, you realize that while we might have invested a little more than $2 billion, and this is about $1.5 billion just in marsh, in, in dredging and marsh creation, um, we're really just making a slight dent in what is needed and what is doable in Louisiana. And that's when you really start to sit back and think about, well, what are the other tools that we potentially have? How big of a footprint do we need to be strategically thinking about um, for our coast as we move forward in the future. We know there will always be a coastal Louisiana because the Mississippi River will always be dumping into the, uh, into the Gulf and it will always carry sediment. The question is how big it's gonna be. And a lot of that gets down to how well we can engineer projects and how well we can get those projects to construction and then utilize those as effectively and efficiently as we possibly can to sustain a large of a pr footprint that we can as well. So, the last, really, five years of my life have been swallowed up by the BP oil spill, um, but definitely the last 11 months. Um, I've had the privilege for the state of Louisiana to serve, in the last since Congressman Graves has moved on, to serve as the lead trustee for the Natural Resources Damage Assessment, um, which puts, puts us engaged in, one, trying to figure out exactly how much damage and injury has occurred to our coast, and then to think about what is the restoration projects that would be done to offset that injury to our coast. Um, this past July, actually July 2nd, um, we announced an agreement in principle to settle not only um, the natural resources and damages, but also the other fines that BP would be responsible for our coast. And so I'm gonna walk through the different money streams. I'm gonna try to give you kind of a high level overview and then I'm gonna walk through some slides that talk about and discuss the different types of projects that we actually think we might perform as a result um, of this expenditures or of the revenue stream that's come. So for the coastal program, there's really three, three different settlements, three different avenues through which money flows to our program. Um, the first one is the criminal penalties. This is something that's already settled. Uh, this was a criminal settlements, there's actually two of them. One was between uh, BP and the federal government and the other was Transoceans and the federal government. 
inside those settlements, uh, the Department of Justice and the responsible party, BP or Transocean, agreed to set aside a total of $1.272 billion to construct barrier islands and or diversions in coastal Louisiana. Um, so these dollars are actually put into what they call the Gulf Environment Benefit Fund that are managed by a nonprofit called the National Fish and Wildlife Federation. And so with those dollars, we're looking at doing engineering and design of just barrier islands and or diversions. That's all the uses of those dollars that are allowed to be um, used for. Um, those dollars, these funds come in over a five year period. The first projects that we kicked out were some barrier island projects as well as a suite of studies of the diversion projects that are included in the master plan. Diversions are an idea that we can truly tap the resources of the river. Um, we've done it in the past for, for the purposes of modifying salinity within basins, largely for helping to control or modify fisheries areas, but we've never really done it to try to tap all of the sediment that's available. And so if you look across the world and look at definitely within the United States, um, this type of structure is somewhat new. And we know that um, from a high level of planning that it sounds neat and there's a, potentially a lot of benefits, but we wanted to do a lot of additional analysis to see if exactly what we're seeing at this high level of planning could, is worthwhile moving these projects into engineering and design. So with about $13 million, we've been analyzing all of the diversion or the sediment diversion projects within the master plan to try to come up with a recommendation for the CPRA board on how best to move forward. And actually, in three weeks, um, I'll be making that recommendation to the board. So those studies are, are coming, um, are ripe. Um, we're starting to look at the results and looking at the effects of not only getting the sediment from the river um, into those basins, what those effects potentially would be on the habitat that is there, what the effects would be on the fisheries that are there, what those effects would be on potentially on the communities that surround the basin or, and are, are on our Gulf Coast. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that has been done. Um, that work was the result of some of these criminal penalty dollars. We wanted to do that work so that we can better shape our decisions on how to utilize the rest of the money. With some of the additional dollars out of the National Fish and Wildlife Fund dollars, we put on that Kamenata project. So I mentioned the $221 million on Kamenata headlands. $144 million of that came from this um, criminal penalties. So that's $144 million out of a settlement that occurred a couple years ago that is actually under construction today. The other two were um, the natural resources damages as well as the civil penalties were part of this agreement in principle. Um, the agreement in principle um, settled out the per barrel fine, which there's been a lot of discussion over. So essentially if a responsible party spills um, oil in this case, um, there's a fine per barrel that they, they have to pay. And typically it's up to $1,100 per barrel. If they find gross negligence, it can be up to $4,300 per barrel. Um, the judge went through um, some trial phases one to determine um, the level of responsible parties, the, the amount of oil, and if there in fact was gross negligence. Um, he did find that there was gross negligence. They did put a number on the amount of oil that was spilt. Um, he never ruled on what that total um, civil fines would be because we came out with the agreement in principle. That fine dollars, out of those fine dollars, um, Congress passed this act called the Restore Act. Um, the Restore Act has a whole different way of which um, the monies flow but we anticipate that through the Restore Act that at least $930 million would be coming to Louisiana. Um, most of those dollars would be determined by the CPRA board for coastal restoration projects. Some of those dollars are competed for. Um, those aren't included in this $930 million. By far the largest amount of money that we're seeing is the natural resource damage dollars. And that is um, under the Oil Pollution Act, the responsible party is, is, must put the environment back to where it was if the spill had not occurred. And so you go through this whole game of hiring teams of scientists to try to figure out where the oil went, what the injury was as a result of that oil, and then you hire whole separate teams of engineers and scientists to come up with ways in which you could restore the environment that, for those injured species, whether they were birds, fish, um, or wetlands. And so for at Louisiana, at least $5 billion of the natural resource damages um, would be coming to Louisiana, assuming that the agreement in principle gets finalized. Where we currently are with these with this, um, dollars is that we anticipate 
um, shortly in the next month, maybe even quite sooner, that um, the trustees would, would put out a damage assessment and restoration plan as well as a consent decree um, that would go out for um, public notice. That would then be submitted to the courts and we're hoping that if everything goes well, um, that it would be finalized sometime in the spring. These dollars get paid at over 15 years. But if you think about the capacity of our program, 15 years is probably a, a, a logical amount of, of time so that the dollars, 390, 400 million dollars a year could be utilized as efficiently and effectively for the work that we do. Um, there definitely is a limitation to the amount of engineers, there's a limitation to the amount of contractors that could do this type of work in coastal Louisiana. So here's a little bit of look at, at, at the types of projects. Um, I've combined all the NERDA projects the, the dollars from Restore as well as the NIFWIF projects to give you a look at what it would look like on the screen. So this is in total a little more, um, it's in that seven to eight billion dollars. A lot of folks question, well, why are you doing anything out west? Well, not all the dollars, especially the Restore dollars, are tied to impacts from the oil spill. Um, they were given to us by the Department of Justice um, for, um, well, for the NIFWIF dollars with the Department of Justice um, for barrier islands and or diversions, the restore dollars are more open broadly um, to doing coastal restoration projects. Some of our priority areas are out west. Um, one of the main priorities is the Calcasieu ship channel and, and the um, salinity, controlling the salinity as a result of that ship channel, looking at a way to maintain a navigation channel as well as control those salinities to limit the amount of wetland loss in that area. And so the Calcasieu, um, Salinity Control Measures is a, a key project for us that we'd be looking at out of the Restore program um, for the West. Um, there's other marsh creation projects, um, Rabbit Island, as well as a shoreline protection project that we would anticipate out West as well through some of those revenue streams. Moving into the areas that um, did see oil, obviously we would anticipate that we would see larger investment. Um, Terrebonne Basin, looking at how do we sustain as much of those wetlands as we possibly can, looking at implementing series of ridges, as well as um, what we call the increase of Chafalaya, or the flow of a Chafalaya into northern Terrebonne. How do we, is it possible to take some of that sediment rich water and move it into the Terrebonne area so that we can better maintain um, the wetlands in the, the Terrebonne Basin? Um, we're also looking at the HNC lock, which would be a very key project for us out of the Restore dollars. It has multiple functions in both reducing the, the salinity, um, effects of salinity on those wetlands as well as maintaining that navigation channel. Our master plan is a combination of actions. It's not simply just to restore the natural environment, but how do we restore the natural environment in a way that's conducive to allow for our communities to be, to sustain here? How do we keep our economy as well as our natural environment so that we, we can make those um, priorities match. Moving even further um, to the east or the southeast of the coast, this is where by far the majority of the dollars that we're looking at putting on the ground. Um, I mentioned before about long distance sediment pipelines. Um, we would be looking at establishing and ideally using riverine sediment going toward the Lake Bourne area, um, potentially toward the Orleans Land Bridge, but that might be a little bit far. Um, and then on the, on the western side of the river, in that area, Bayou DuPont, significant amount of additional investment into the Bayou DuPont area um, for marsh creation, as well as looking at implementing a diversion on both the east side and the west side of the river. Those decisions on diversions will be largely um, a result and be spent on a, re a result of the, annou the announcement what we're looking at doing next week as we, s we finalize those studies um, for what is doable and what is here. Um, and again, a tremendous amount of investment in our barrier islands. So you're seeing truly, again, a combination of projects, not just marsh creation, but marsh creation, diversions, barrier islands, some oyster projects, um, as well as some shoreline protection projects that would be for Louisiana. Here's a look at it as a whole, and um, that's all I've got, which hopefully is enough. All right, Mr. Graham, thank you so much. The audience has some questions. I'll start with one of my own. And, and you mentioned that some areas are not, uh, you're not able to protect or restore or sustain. What communities, which communities are we talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it, uh, and it, it, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so we haven't necessarily, there are definitely communities that are on the outside of a lot of the hurricane protection system. For example, Lafitte. Um, there's investments that are going on, on in Lafitte, but it's not necessarily a, um, full-blown um, ring levy currently that is being invested in there. Um, there's a lot of the outlying camp areas 
um, down to the south, even on Grand Isle. There's a burrito levy there, but there's nothing else that is scheduled to go on for those areas. So um, that's pretty common throughout the coast, but it really comes down to trying to match up uh, how much that land loss, what is the subsidence rates, what is actually going to be the sea level rates, sea level rise rates um, with the anticipated land loss. So that discussion becomes a lot more difficult to have. Okay. Uh, Vic Frankowitz, I believe it is, uh, asks, compared to the 2012 master plan, will the 2017 plan have more in the way of non-structural proposals for areas outside of the levy system, such as land use planning and long-term relocation plans? You, you'll see a lot more um, definition to the non-structural. Um, non-structural is hard uh, for lots of different reasons. One, because it's, it's really the local communities that you're looking at implementing. Um, some of the work that's been done out of the Restore Act is to try to get and, and encourage the locals to have a land use plan, and we're working tightly with the communities on land use plans. Um, We've done a tremendous amount of additional work on identifying specific structures for the non-structural program. So instead of large blocks with dollars being in those blocks, you're going to see a lot more detail as to what we would anticipate the dollars going to, toward and how the non-structural program would be carried out. Another member of the audience asks, what major changes will need to be done to the master plan when it's updated in 2017, especially with regard to estimated sea level rise and subsidence trends? How will they affect the estimated cost of the plan? We will, we will be, so when we did the master plan, we actually looked at about 100 different scenarios for the future without action. We chose two. Um, we chose a more optimistic and a less optimistic um, sea level rise and subsidence rates, in which it would be the background in which we put our models. Our less optimistic will even be more less optimistic. So in this next master plan, we will anticipate an even larger um, amount of potential sea level rise. We don't necessarily look at the two extremes. Um, so we're really looking at like a 25 and 75% if, if it was all on a range um, as to what we're planning against. And we see that that's a lot, feel that that's a lot more beneficial in trying to evaluate the overall projects. But our, our range will be extended as a result of some of the science and some of the things that have been coming out at, um, as a result of some of the studies from the sea level rise. Okay. Claude Schlesinger asks, why is there so much loss at the mouth of the Mississippi River where there are no levees? In other words, isn't uh, the mouth of the river just as it always has been for hundreds of years? Uh, so it's a lot closer to the shelf. Um, so when you start to um, utilization of those sediments, a lot of those sediments end up being dumped off of the Mississippi River as opposed to coming out through the displays. And even when they are, if you look at like the West Bay area, it's a lot deeper. And so you don't necessarily see um, the benefits of those sediments. And so the goal would be to get them up into the shallower areas where they can be trapped, where we would have more um, marsh being built over time. So you have uh, trying to deposit the sediments along with offsetting the amount of subsidence. And the subsidence rates on the mouth of the river are pretty extreme. Do you think Louisiana's share of the offshore oil and gas royalties is at risk of being diverted to other federal projects? There, the president came out um, with a policy inside of his, um, so this is the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act dollars. This goes back to a 2006 energy bill. Um, inside this last budget that came from the president's office, as opposed to keeping those dollars for Louisiana, um, he came out with a policy that he would pool it and be, utilize it for lots of other areas that opened it up. And so anytime you have a policy like that start to be established, there definitely is some concern. Um, there's a lot of additional steps to undo that legislation that's been passed by Congress. So currently we don't feel that there's a huge threat, um, but having that type of policy out there is often the, the initial seed um, towards something larger. So we'd have to see how that works out. If the CPRA board approves the governor's request to allocate BP dollars to the LA Bridge One project, uh, does this set a precedent for other infrastructure projects to be funded with the BP money? So the, the precedent's been set for a long time. Um, if you look at whether it's the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act dollars, if you look at the Restore dollars, if you look at the, the legislation that established um, the Coastal Trust Fund, all of them allow for a percentage of those funds for infrastructure. When we go back to the Coastal Master Plan, um, we recognize that it's not just building wetlands, it's not just doing um, levees, but there's also a communities piece that is an infrastructure piece. And so I do think that it's important as the CPRA board matures for them to start thinking about a policy on how to best um, spend the dollars and meet the needs and, and the intent of both the legislative body and the state 
as well as Congress, which both opened up the door for those possible infrastructure dollars. So I, I do think it's realistic that eventually you would see some of the dollars going to those key pieces of infrastructure. And in fact, they're not only underlying some of the, um, the, the funding sources and legislation been passed, but it's also part of the master plan that um, was approved as well. Okay. Len Orgeron asks, uh, there was a, a recent report of a competition regarding coastal restoration. Two recommendations from the competition involved diverting the Mississippi River in to below English Turn or Port Sulphur. What, what are your thoughts about that? So the, those studies looked really much longer term. Um, they looked out 100 years. And uh, when you start, we chose a 50 year time frame because when you start getting out in time, the uncertainty has become really large. Um, I do think it's important for us to be thinking big. What is doable with Louisiana? Uh, it goes back to my earlier statements that there will always be a coastal Louisiana. It comes down to how quickly we can sustain it and how quickly we can put those tools in place and what the environmental conditions actually are that we're putting in place against as to what those um, different solutions look like. So, I do think it's healthy to be thinking that far out. That's not where we are in our th thinking currently because of the uncertainties that go out there. Um, but it, I think it's overall beneficial to the discussion that one day that could be a possibility and there's a lot of potential pros and cons when you look at that. Okay. Uh, Dakota Fisher asks, what is the current progress of the CPRA and its non-structural mitigation programs? Yeah, so that is by far the, the, the program that has see, seen the least amount of resources. So our dollars have come to date um, th for the purposes of structural for protection, um, for the purposes of restoration. Uh, we would anticipate as our new revenue stream comes online, which is the GoMesa dollars, that we would see a larger commitment of those GoMesa dollars to the non-structural programs. But as a result of where we've been getting the dollars, it hasn't necessarily been practical to invest in that. Um, it is also becomes a challenge um, when you have limited dollars as to how you prioritize and put them. And protection by far has been, uh, structural protection by far has been the greatest need and that's been what's fed. So I, I would anticipate seeing a larger investment and a, a larger priority put on the non-structural um, as time progresses. What's the status of planning for river diversion projects south of New Orleans and when will key decisions for proceeding with construction of those projects be made? Yes, so in three weeks we'll be making uh, a recommendation to the CPRA board on what would be moved um, into engineering and design. Um, that will go for um, funding in our annual plan cycle, which gets approved in March of next year by the legislature, March, April timeframe. So we would be spending dollars in June. We're looking at about a three to five year, ideally hopefully three year for engineering design and permitting on those structures before they go to construction. So in the perfect world, in about five years, we would have our first diversion that we would have online um, for operating in Louisiana. Okay. Claire Renault of Leaf Environmental asks, what's the percent of dredge material being used for coastal restoration? Ooh, that's a great question. And I don't know it in actual cubic yards. Um, I do know it in numbers. Um, well, actually, I kind of do know it in cubic yards. So um, right now, we utilize about uh, 10,000 cubic, is that right? 10 million cubic yards per year out of the Mississippi River for purposes of coastal restoration. That's over the last three years. The core handles about 20 million cubic yards at the base of the river. Um, that's, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're using half of it. It just means we're drawing about half of what the core is excavating out of the river at the same time. How are your barrier island restoration projects expected to keep up with sea level rise, anticipated rates of sea level rise? Future investment. The barrier islands are remnant structures. Um, and so if we're going to rely on the, the um, barrier islands for the purposes of storm surge or for the purposes of protecting our wetlands, we're going to constantly have to be investing in those barrier islands. Um, we do think that if there's more sediment in the system, we can prolong the life of those. Um, but we need to get to a place similar to the Netherlands where there is an annual investment for lifts on the Barrier Islands. Maybe it's $20 million per year so that we're sustaining the, the investment that we've made. All right. Is there an industry for this? I mean, could, could Louisiana be the center for some kind of industry in restoring the coast and restoring uh, these lands that are being lost, sea level there, rise? There absolutely is, and um, we are quickly becoming that place um, if we aren't already. Um, as mentioned before, we have a lot more investment here than anywhere else in the world in this environmental restoration. We're seeing the contractors, we're seeing the investment from 
um, the engineering and design firms that do this type of work, and we would anticipate that we'll have a very robust community, especially as we look at a 15-year revenue stream um, for this type of work. Scott Howard asks, will the full suite of projects over the next 50 years, if, if implemented, be most likely to, one, slow down land destruction, two, stop land destruction, or three, reverse land destruction? I like the looks of green maps better than the red ones, he says. S <laughs> slow down. Um, even when, even when we were a fully functioning delta and we were growing, um, we always had land loss. Uh, it just shifts it around. Um, so before 1932, we were growing to about three quarters of a, a um, square mile per year. That's what it's estimated. But we were losing in areas of our coast. And so it just depends on where the resources are being utilized. So you're really looking at slow down. We do anticipate that we could get to a spot where we would be stable. Okay. Uh, another question, how much is the oil industry construct, uh, contributing to the restoration and protective projects outside of the BP dollars? Uh, most of it's through land rights. Um, so we're starting to have much better conversations with the oil and gas industries, um, looking forward to how to pr better protect and marry our program with their infrastructure. But a lot of the work that we're getting is the cooperation through land rights. Most of the land that we're working on is their land that we're working on currently. What percentage of work is done by private contractors compared to state workers and the Corps of Engineers? Yeah, so we only have 168 employees. Most of our folks simply are contract managers. Um, so if I had to guess, I'd say 90% of the work, engineering and design, as well as all of the construction is being done by private contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, dollars from the state. Mildred uh, Congemi asks, in 2017, we're to receive offshore royalties from oil with the price of oil down. Uh, will we have uh, the money to continue protection and restoration projects? Yeah, so we haven't gotten new protections, uh, projections out of the Department of Interior that lets those. Um, the last ones we saw were at the $140 million range. It's my understanding that the way that the, um, the formula comes off of the lease revenues that we don't anticipate a huge reduction of those initially, but if oil and gas pro um, prices stay low, we would potentially see a reduction in that over time. Okay. The percentage of river flow into the Atchafalaya is uh, currently controlled. Is there discussion of allowing more flow through the Atchafalaya to build land in that area of Louisiana? Yeah, there, actu there absolutely is, but that's an action that has to be taken by Congress. and so. You got lots of years of studies to getting to a spot where we can formally make that recommendation, but we do anticipate taking our tools that we've been working with the Corps of Engineers on the lower river and extending up higher so that we can start to look at shifting that percentage. Okay. Michael Majimi, I believe it is, of BTNEP asks, can you explain LCA? Why did the state depart from the Corps? What projects remain in partnership? What is cross-crediting and will the result, and will this result in more LCA project I, I implementation? I need another hour, Mike. Um, <laughs> but LCA is an authorized program through the Water Resources Development Act of 2007. It authorized about $8 billion for the projects. Um, we have not been able to get construction dollars through the LCA program outside the FUDMAP program. Um, those projects that were included in there were priority projects for the state of Louisiana. A lot of those priority projects are being implemented with dollars that we can get. Um, so we're not waiting on federal appropriations to move these projects forward as quickly as we can. We've been working with the Corps to get credit for the projects that we're building so that the remaining projects and a lot of the goals of the LCA is to better utilize the river sediment so that in the future we can utilize the credit accrued um, toward the LCA programs when federal appropriations come in. So, um, there's, we, but we could do hours on that subject. Somebody in the audience asks, what has to be done to advance these uh, needed restoration projects faster? Uh, probably regulatory hurdles is the largest one. Um, we're, we're throwing a whole lot of additional projects and permitting on the same amount of fish and wildlife folks, Corps of Engineers, regulatory folks. So the, if, as we look forward, permitting is a huge constraint. Um, we're doing a much better job at um, pooling our data, but there's a tremendous amount of data that the oil and gas companies have for geotech. Geotech analysis takes a long time. So if we're able to get better access to that, we could speed up some of those projects as well. It's been reported that land rights have been a, an impediment. Are, is that still an issue or, or not? On, on the protection side, land rights become a larger issue because we're actually looking at acquiring portions of the land, and sometimes um, that gets a little sticky. Nobody necessarily wants a levee in their backyard unless they think, it, like my kids, look at them as mountains, which is really sad. Um, <laughs> 
But on the restoration side, uh, most folks like having their land rebuilt. Um, and so we haven't seen a whole lot of impacts on the restoration side, but definitely on the protection side, um, there, there's potentially some sticky wickets there, but we've been working with um, the locals and getting better defined plans, letting the public know exactly where we're looking at going and why far enough advanced so that we don't have the dollars sitting there waiting on to get those implemented in those holdups. Okay. Finally, you mentioned that uh, if we want to see these barrier islands that have been rebuilt, we should fly over soon because they may not be there very long. I mean, does that indicate that uh, this is a, not a worthwhile project, or w what's the message no, there? I think it's part of the overall regime. So if you look at the, the $50 billion plan, we actually rebuild the barrier islands multiple times. Um, so we just rebuilt them. Um, we're going to need to rebuild them again probably in 10 to 15 years. But every day, um, we're seeing less and less of them. But it, again, it comes that this is the system that we're utilizing to protect our communities. Those are investments that we're going to be making. And this isn't something that is just lasting for 50 years. It's for as long as we have communities on the Delta. Mr. Graham, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. A marathon of questions. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Thanks again to Iberia Bank for their generous sponsorship of this breakfast briefing. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. We hope this event has been informative. As a member of BGR, I encourage those of you who are not already BGR members to join us. You'll find details in the brochures on your table. And we hope to see you at the next event.